today is appendicitis. You have to know this. This is high yield information. This is so common. You probably know a friend that already had the appendix removed. It would be nice to kind of understand the pathophysiology behind it. Let's jump on the bandwagon. The first thing I want us to go over is the definition, right? This is the appendix in this picture right here. And if we break the word into two, appendicitis is the inflammation of the appendix. Very simple, but it's not that simple. Let's find out exactly what's causing it. Now, before we talk about the causes, let's go over the anatomy. Now, people really kind of, most people kind of know what, what the pain feels like. So everybody kind of understand what the, the pain of appendicitis is, right lower quadrant pain, periumbilical kind of radiating down to the right lower quadrant, but let's really focus on the anatomy. So here's your ascending colon, I kind of cut off the uh, ileum, uh, ileocolic junction over there, but here's your cecum and that's the appendix. Now, I want you to see something. This is the belly button, right? That's the periumbilical area. And I just drew the spinal cord because we're going to talk about pathophysiology. But before we go into that, now that I've seen where the appendix is, usually in the right lower quadrant of the belly, what could cause this? Well, the first thing you want to know is lymphoid hyperplasia, which is basically lymph nodes that are swollen, the hyperplastic lymph nodes. They obstruct this guy, and they cause venous congestion. But before we go ahead, the next thing that causes it, faecalith. Hard poop, right? Gets stuck in there. That's number two. Number three, tumors. Carcinoid. Carcinoid tumors are serotonin producing tumors, right? They cause flushing, diarrhea, wheezing. You know, we're going to talk about them someday when we go over another lecture. Foreign bodies, right? You swallow a huge coin, goes through the bowel, and accidentally drops in there. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. Not too good. But the most common ones you want to know are these top three. Okay? Now, now that we know what causes it, I think understanding the pathophysiology of what causes the symptoms of appendicitis is extremely important. That is the importance of drawing this picture. Now, the first thing that happens initially, it's the organ problem, right? The appendix. That's why the pain actually doesn't start at the right lower quadrant. It's going to start periumbilical. Why does it start periumbilical dull pain? Look at this afferent fiber supplying the appendix. They pick up the nerve sensation and they jump on the back wagon by crossing with the T10 sympathetic nerve that synapse and go into the spinal cord. And these guys send efferent signals at the level of T10. And that's why patients always start with periumbilical pain. It starts around the belly button it hurts that's why it's the t10 sympathetic nerve t10 t pain right t pain it's because of the sympathetic nerves that go together with this afferent fiber supplying the what the appendix they go into the spinal cord and they come and kind of cause this dull aching periumbilical pain that's where it starts but however as the appendix starts to get inflamed bigger and bigger, right, the inflammation, all of it start sudden, start to rub on the peritoneal cavity. And eventually, the skeletal muscles, right, the rectus abdominis, uh, um, the transversalis muscles, the oblique muscles, they get inflamed, and then it becomes right lower. But now, because now the inflammation is so much, it transmits to the wall. It's transmural inflammation, and there you get right lower quadrant. That's why you get the periumbilical pain transmitting down to the right lower quadrant. That is the pathophysiology. Now it's more localized, it's more intense, it's very painful. That is the pathophysiology of appendicitis. 
Isn't that cool? I think that's cool that you know that. Now you can go and shine and explain to people that this is actually a visceral, which means organ, somatic, reflex, pain. Because it starts with the organ first, but the organ is not inflamed to the point it's touching the skin. It's just inflamed so that the pain fibers are able to pick it up. And the afferent pain fibers from the appendix accompany the sympathetic T10 trunks, goes into the spinal cord and causes inflammation around the T10. The efferent takes it out, and that's where the periumbilical start. And now it becomes somatic, which is body. It goes to the body after the inflammation is bad enough to inflame the peritoneum and also the skeletal muscles, the parietal peritoneum. And that's why we get all this. Very easy, isn't it? That's my job. So we talk about the definition, we talk about the causes, we talk about pathophysiology, let's talk about history. What are these patients gonna present with, right? I told you already, periumbilical pain eventually going to the right lower quadrant. Nausea, these patients are vomiting. Right lower quadrant pain. Where exactly is the point you need to know for boards and for, bo for the wards is this point. Two thirds of the way down here is called the make burnish point. That's usually where the pain, the right lower quadrant pain is localized. Nausea, vomiting. Right lower quadrant, it lasts for hours. It's kind of dull in nature. Sometimes it's sharp. Now, this is one thing you're gonna notice. These patients don't wanna eat. They have anorexia. So it's right lower quadrant pain, which you just start peri umbilical first. They have nausea. They are vomiting. Now, if the patient says, I wanna eat the food, you want a sandwich? That's called the hamburger sign. No, that means it's not appendicitis. So that's how we fool patients. When I walk into the room, I'm like, man, do you feel like you want to eat anything? They're like, yeah, I would like a you know, scrambled egg right now. Oh, okay, now that's not appendicitis. That's called the hamburger sign. But the nausea, vomiting, they're going to be anorexic because they don't want to eat. They have loss of appetite. So you want to know that. Now, on physical exam, they might have some slight fever also, so you want to keep an eye on that. They might have a low-grade fever, but usually these are the most common symptoms. Now, on physical exam, what do you want to do? There's a couple of tests you can do. Something called the Rolfsing sign. And the idea of the Rolfsing sign is you push on the left lower quadrant of the belly and you push down and if pain is elicited on the right side, so you push on this side and like, do you feel pain here? Yeah, that's a positive Rolf sings. This test are not specific or sensitive enough, but if they do come back positive, it's very specific for appendicitis. Now, another test is called the obturator sign. Now in obturator sign, Let's see, let's have the patient lie on their back. Okay, this is the bed, and the patient is lying on their back, okay? And you take their leg, and you cross it to the other side. I'm not really drawing this well. Basically, you take one of their legs, and you cross it to this side, and when you cross their leg to this side, you push away, right? You push away, and you try to push in, if they try to AD duct, it's gonna elicit pain around the sores because the irritation of the sores, that's gonna hurt like a son of a gun. So that's a positive obturator sign. The last one, but not the least, is the sore sign. Sore sign, you have the patient lay on their back, right, on their butt, and you tell them to raise their leg as high as they can, and you push down this way, and they resist, and they feel a lot of pain in the right lower quadrant, that's a positive sore sign. So those are the three signs you wanna check to make sure they might have appendicitis. You wanna push here at the McBurnis point and let go 
and see if they have rebound tenderness because that might be a really bad sign if they have a rebound tender but they will definitely have pain in the right lower corner when you push if they have rebound tender they might have, might have perforated and that is bad you don't want to have a perforated appendix so if they do have perforation though their virus signs are going to be unstable right because if they perforate peritonitis they get into sepsis they get hypotensive tachycardic they have a lot of high white blood cell count so that is a serious complication now, the only issue we run into in medicine is children, immun immunocompromised, pregnant patients. These patients, they have a retro cecal appendix. The appendix is always at the back of the, uh, of the uh, cecum. So we miss it. The problem is we miss those, and this can make these people die. So you want to make sure you don't want to miss this in a lot of these patients. Because they have a typical presentation. How do we diagnose this? Now, this is one of the disease process that you as a clinician has to have a clinical suspicion. Guess what? It's a clinical diagnosis. Trust me, you diagnose it clinical with all your hands and all your knowledge. By the science, the history, and the physical exam, it's a clinical diagnosis. But if you can't diagnose it clinically, you can order some tests. You could order an ultrasound. If you order ultrasound, you take a look at the area. You try to see if there's uh, loss of the sore shadow. If there's loss of the sore shadow, that's giving it away. They might have appendicitis. Now, another thing, because the sore is all the way at the back here, right? Coming from the, if I have to draw it out, the sore comes out this way. It's going to run all the way and attach to allow you to be able to flex your leg. So the appendix might be sitting over there and causes inflammation. If you put an ultrasound machine, you're not going to be able to see the sore shadow. So it's going to cause the, uh, you can do an ultrasound. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I take that back. That, before we, that was for, uh, that's a KUB test, which is the kidney, ureter, and the bladder test. The ultrasound will be able to show you an enlarged and non-compressible appendix. If the app appendix can be compressed, that's telling you you have appendicitis. And we can order a CT scan, which is, shows what? peri stranding. So that's one thing you're going to notice on CAT scan. And the CAT scan is the most specific. It can actually show you what the appendix looks like. Um, and the appendix is always large. It has a lot of fluid, right? Inflammation causes a lot of fluid around the area. So now, let's talk about treatment. How do we treat these patients, right? It's a clinical diagnosis, but you can still use this, all the diagnostic studies to try to diagnose this. On labs, you're gonna see a lot of white count, right? WBCs, high white count, around 11,000 to 15,000. That's usually what their white count looks like. Before we forget, we have to order labs, right? We can't just jump straight, uh, you know, without since you actually have an infection. Uh, another thing you want to, it also comes with a left shift, which is basically neutrophils shifting to the left, like banding, a lot of neutrophilic infiltration. So you want to keep an eye on that. So another thing you want to order is a urine. Get a urinalysis. You might see some red blood cells and some white blood cells. And the reason is because this inflammation can affect the ureters coming from the bladder and cause a little bit of white blood cells in your urine. So that's another thing you can also use. But otherwise, it's clinical. It's really not much you can order that than that. So treatment-wise, how do we treat this patient? You want to have bowel rest, right? You want to keep the bowel from eating. MPO, they're not eating anything. You give them antibiotics. The antibiotics we give is sephortitin, Sephotitin, sephotitin. That's what you want to give them for antibiotics. Also, you want to give them a lot of fluids. IV fluids, bowel rest, antibiotics. And because this is appendicitis, you're not going to let them go home. You're going to call surgery. And you're going to get a laparoscopic appendectomy which basically means to take a couple of scopes, to go to your, your uh, abdomen, to go in there and to cut it off. 
and they cut this piece out, and then you get an appendectomy. And that's the only treatment you can give for it. You take it out. Right? You're not going to send them home. There's no way you send them home on this because they can perforate, which is one of the severe complications of appendicitis. So you want to watch out for that. That's extremely important. If they do perf, cover them with a lot of antibiotics and come to check their white count to see if the white count actually goes down. All right? Another thing that can actually develop is an abscess. They can develop an abscess after the surgery and you have to go in and drain it. Okay? So we talk about appendicitis. It's very important that you know it. It's always common in people between the, you know, 20 and 30 years old, so young adults always get it. Uh, more common in also males, so that's another thing you want to remember. Uh, so between 10 and 30 years old patients, so if the young generation are going to come into the hospital coming with all this complaint. And we talk about the definition, which is an inflammation, right? Right periumbilical, right lower quadrant pain, okay? Nausea, vomiting, they do not want to eat. If they say they want to eat, think of something else. It's not appendicitis. Okay, it's clinical, you only take care of it by surgery, you do a bar rest, MPO, make sure they're not eating any food, give them antibiotics to cover gram negative, a lot of fluids, and you have to take the appendix out to a lapar uh, laparoscopic procedure. All right, that is the end of our lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.